Father, we thank you so very much as we come together and to partake of your word, God, to receive the daily bread, the fresh bread from heaven. Lord, as I open my mouth to speak on your behalf, I pray that you would fill it with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Father, you're in control. I'm just the vessel, God, that you've chosen, Father. Lord, I just pray that as I hear the Holy Spirit minister and as I feel the tug of the Holy, the pull of the Holy Ghost, Lord, I will go forth and let him rule and reign, God, that he might reign and rule, that the glory will go to Jesus Christ and that lives will be changed and we will forever be uh, exalted in the earth concerning the will of God in this earth. Thank you, Father, for the total, total, total outpouring of your spirit that we're going to experience on this day as we've already done. Uh, and gotten a smidgen of it we just believe that a deeper depth of the spirit will move through the anointing father as the word of God goes forth thank you that signs will follow the word Jesus that you'll confirm your word with signs following God that souls will be ushered into the kingdom of heaven Lord that lives will be changed that God the gifts will move father that the name of the Lord will be magnified in the earth have your way, Holy Ghost. Let it be that we won't be the same that we were when we came in, Father, as we leave. And we give all glory, thanks, praise, and honor to you for everything you have in store for us this day and the rest of this week. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Take your seats, if you will, and open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of St. Luke, chapter 2. I'm going to try to do this as quick as I can. St. Luke, chapter 2. This is nothing deep. It's just a word of encouragement. It's just a word of encouragement. The Holy Spirit put it in my heart. <clears throat> a word of encouragement just to remind us, to remind us. God's getting ready to do some things in us, and we're going to have to be 100% on board of everything the Holy Spirit is asking to do. Yeah. We can't veer to the left or to the right. We can't be off, but we have to be on point, 100%. You know how it is when you build a house and if you build a certain house, and if you're off, I learned this through Charles Jefferson, even when we were building this church here. When we put this whole thing together, this guy was a stickler. He used to really get under my skin. He was so perfect when it came to measurements. And I would be like, but well, come on, let's, let's not go that crazy. Way. No, it's got to be right. It's got to be right. You know, when we would, when we would uh, put a certain measurement down on the floor, and at the end, 40 feet down, it may be off by about a quarter of an inch, maybe even a half an inch. But way down here, 40 feet down this way, it's on point, but 40 feet away, it's one quarter, uh, one fourth of an inch to a half an inch off. And he would say, nope, we gotta go back and make sure we scoot it up a little bit. I said, come on, man, this, some of that stuff has already been nailed down. Well, we gotta take it up. I said, over an inch, come on, a half inch. I said, nobody's gonna see it with the naked eye. Look, man, the corner's gonna be off. I said, bump the corner. Who's gonna look at the corner and sit there with a microscope? But he was to a perfection because he's used to building bigger buildings and larger edifices and so forth. And if it's not right and if it's not on point, then that thing can end up being way off on the other end. So that's how it is with the Lord. If we just err, in the littlest, smallest little idiosyncrasy of a thing that we are not even paying too close attention to, later on that thing could be a mile off. And you could be out of the will of God and not even know it. This has happened. I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've seen people start off in a blaze of glory when it comes to walking with Jesus Christ. I've had conversations with young people that I've personally trained and groomed myself and uh, taught and invested time and effort and energy and pumping the word of God in them and so forth. And I've seen them say stuff to me like, man, I don't see how Christians backslide. I don't see how Christians are off. I don't see how Christians get deceived. How is this possible? If they only keep their eyes focused on Jesus. And I said, well, hey, you know, believe it or not, it can happen to anyone. And, and, and the very ones I had talked to today are backslidden. I'm not making this up. They're all backslidden. Three people I have in mind. They're all, they're all off onto a tangent in another religion, in fact. And they started off right. But now they're, they're, they're you know, and you, you wonder, and here they were saying, I don't see how it could happen. Yet it happened to them. It happened to them. And, and if we don't do certain things, it can happen to anyone. That's why we've always got to be on point when it comes to Jesus Christ. Just remember one thing. God doesn't take any delight in your flesh at all. 
The Bible says it this way. There's no good thing that dwells in us. That is in our flesh. However, this old, you know, messed up, rejected body of ours, God has chosen vessels of dishonor. He's, he's chosen us to put his transcendent glory in and to use us. We're all scarred and marred with sin. The Bible puts it this way. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. All of us have the propens propensity to sin. We have the uh, attraction to sin. It's easier for us to do sinful acts than it is for us to practice righteous acts. Amen. Because sinfulness is a part of the nature. Sin is in the code of our DNA. It's a natural thing to sin. Your natural response to, is to sin. That's what we're born in sin, shaped in wickedness or iniquity, and we have to be born again in order to make it into the kingdom of God because we cannot be born the first birth and expect to make it into heaven without having to go through Christ Jesus to be forgiven or exonerated or expunged, if you will, of our sin. And when we have Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, he removes the stain of sin and then through him we have righteousness. And when God looks at us, he doesn't look at us anymore. He looks at the stain of his son's blood in our hearts. And therefore, he looks at us as sons and daughters because of the finished work Jesus Christ has done on Calvary. Now, Luke chapter 2, verse 41 through 52. I'm going to ask somebody to do it like we used to do back in the old days. I want somebody to stand up and read for me. Who would be willing to do that? You know how they used to say, read. The Lord said, the Lord said, read. He said that if you go, if you go, read. <laughs> now, I'm not going to go that far with it. <laughs> But I want somebody to read for me. Luke chapter 2, verses 40 through 52. That's 12 verses. I need somebody with a good, strong voice that can read for me to read. Any volunteer? Yes, sir. Come on here now. That's what I'm talking about. Luke chapter what, Pastor? Luke chapter 2, verses 40 through 52. All right, sir. And it says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. That's our reading from the New King James. That's yes, that's fine, sir. Keep going. Right. You're doing a wonderful job. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was, it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Verse 49, and he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Verse 50, but they did not understand the statement which he had spoke to them. Keep going, sir. Yes, sir, to verse 52. Verse 51 says, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Amen. amen. Somebody say amen. Thank you, sir, for the powerful, strong voice. That's what I like. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you've just heard the story. You heard the story. Uh, here was Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who was born in AD 1, the one that is so powerful that he is, in fact, the central focus of the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The Jesus that the Old Testament looked upon as things that were a shadow of things to come. That Old Testament was referring to Christ the whole time because in the mind of God, the Bible says, worthy is the Lamb of God, Jesus, slain before the foundation of the world. Before God even created man, before he ever even invented the earth or the galaxies or the universe, in the mind of God, God thought, hey, this is what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to send you down, Jesus, 
on a cross to die for men and women you don't even know who are going to backstab you, curse you to your face, literally rebel against you, do every abominable thing anti-God, but yet I want you to go down if you're willing to do so. Jesus says, prepare for me your body, Father. I'll go down and pay man's debts but the stroke of my life. God says, good thing. And Jesus said this, now, Holy Spirit, I am going to divorce myself from all of the anointing and all of the power because I am God in flesh. And I'm going to give up my deity and I'm going to be made the son of man. I'm going to die like a man and I'm going to be buried like a man. And he said, I can't get up on my own. So the only way I'm going to be able to get up, Holy Ghost, is you're going to have to raise me from the dead. Are you willing to pay that price? The Holy Ghost said, I got your back, Jesus. Give me the word. I've got your back. Then the plan of God was instituted in order. Then all of a sudden, Satan comes up here, you know, prancing and going on, you know, and he's, well, you know, strolling around and going on, and he's trying to look at all of the functions and malfunctions of mankind, and, you know, and they're looking in heaven to see, well, who's worthy to go down and pay that kind of price? And they looked up under the altar, they saw Jesus, the Lamb of God, under the altar of God in heaven. Amen? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became the Son of Man that we, the sons of men, might become the sons of God. So Jesus said, I'll go down and pay the price. I'll do it. He told the devil, he says, now you meet me at Calvary's brow about 42 generations from now. And devil, you be there, you be there on time. Amen? Jesus wasn't playing around. So Jesus came into our world in the fullness of time, the Bible says. He was written in the volume of the book that it was written of him to do the will of God in the perfect time. God had Old Testament prophets that were prophesied about a better promise, a better covenant. Back in the Old Testament, it says in the book of Hebrews that, you know, it's not possible for the blood of bullocks and goats to forever keep right. us cleansed right. through, you know, eternal, uh, uh, you know, uh, submission of, 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 of our sin and so forth. But you would have to continue to kill the goats and the, you know, bullocks and oxen and all these different animals for a blood sacrifice. But God had a better covenant. He was going to come in the flesh himself through Jesus Christ as he would put on the body of human flesh and become the lamb of of God. So because of that very event back in the Old Testament, they had what they called the Passover. The Passover. Now during this event, here they are on their way to the Passover feast. My brother here just read it so eloquently. They're on their way to the Passover feast. Okay, this was the custom of the Jews every year during the month of April and May, March, April, right around there, the month on the calendar of the Jewish calendar, the month of Nisan, or Nisan, that particular month was the time of the Passover, what we call the time of Easter, if you will, yes. what we call Easter, you know, which is the resurrection, actually, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now it was during this particular time that they were going to this particular feast, and here they would do this every single year. It was called the Feast of the Passover. It was called the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, where the bread had to be baked without any leaven in it because leaven was a type of sin. Right. So it had to be sinless. God didn't want any sinfulness to remind him of anything because he knew one day he would have to eradicate sin from the world. Sin was what caused mankind to be cursed. And as a result of that sin, the only way they could be forgiven is he, God, would have to come down and take the sin of the entire world upon himself and die as a curse because the Bible says, cursed is everyone that dies upon a tree. And Jesus had to die on a tree or on the cross. But everything in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus Christ that would come. We talked about the tabernacle last week and how we're the tabernacle today with the modern day tabernacle. So the Passover is a very significant event that the historians will remind us that Israel never forgot. They had to keep this custom year after year after year because it brought us way back during the time when the Egyptians were captured for 430 years under the rulership of uh, Egypt. And they were literally held as slaves and they multiplied over a 430 year period of time to where they were anywhere between two to five, maybe six million people. Some people say 1.5 1, 1. to 2 million. Others say 2.5 to 4 million. But it varied. You know, we don't know exactly how many millions were involved, but we know one thing. There was a huge congregation of folks <laughs> yeah. that were Jews. Amen? Yeah. 
We do know that. And during this particular time, the Jews were in a land called Goshen, which was in, in Egypt, but it was a, a suburb of Egypt called Goshen. And it was, they were positioned there, and their tents were there. And then God raised up Moses, who was the lawgiver. He was the one that would literally uh, usher the children of Israel into the promised land, or shall I say, on his way to the promised land. And of course, Joshua was the one that actually gave each person their inheritance and what location and the different lots that they were to take. Because Moses, if you can recall, died in the wilderness with the children of Israel. And Joshua succeeded Moses. But during this particular time, God said this. He went to Pharaoh in the, in the person of Moses and said, let my people go. Each time Pharaoh went before, uh, Moses went before Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardened his heart and said, I'm not going to do it. A plague will take place. And then, you know, a second plague will take place of flies. And then a third plague of frogs. And another plague, plague of boils and all these different things. You know, ten different plagues will take place of nine at that point. But the, the last plague or the, the, the one that was the worst of all was the one because Pharaoh had hardened his heart nine different occasions. And God told Moses, he says, now this is what I want you to do. I want you to give instruction to every person in, in Goshen, all of the children of Israel, to take for themselves each household representative, each man, the head of the house, was to take a lamb. And he was to slit the lamb's throat, drain the blood of the lamb in a basin, which is a bucket. Okay? And the blood would be drained, and then he would take this plant called hyssop. It was, a, it was a branch from the hyssop uh, uh, plant, and he would have to dip the blood in the hyssop, or the hyssop into the uh, basin with the blood, and he would go toward the tents. Each tent represented in Israel had a doorway, and the tent had two side posts, you know, and an and a upper lintel. The upper lintel and the side posts made like a door. He was to take the blood and apply the blood on the two side posts. Here, here in the upper lintel. Here, here in the upper lintel. That was a cross, a perfect cross. That represented the blood of Jesus down on that cross before it even took place. Yeah. Everything in the Old Testament was emblematic and it was a type of Jesus Christ that would come. A better covenant. He, Jesus, was the Lamb of God. It couldn't be any lamb that you would sacrifice. You just couldn't go out there in the field and just choose a lamb. Had to be a male, not a female. Right. Right. Then it had to be one year old or, or, or below. And it couldn't have any spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Meaning it couldn't have a broken hoof. The eye couldn't be gogged out in a fight. It couldn't have no you know, pieces of hair missing or anything. But it had to be examined. And it had to be a perfect lamb without spot or wrinkle. Then you had to go and take it outside of the city and kill it. Then you brought the blood back into the city. The same process that they did on the Day of Atonement. And if you notice, Jesus was the Lamb of God. Because when he was killed, he had to be taken outside of Jerusalem to be crucified at a place called Golgotha or the place of the skull. And that's where they killed or crucified Jesus Christ. Amen? Now here they are, and they, they took the blood and they applied it on both side posts and the upper lintel of every entrance of the tent. And God said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my angel, my death angel. He's going to come and visit all of Egypt. And wherever the angel sees the blood applied, Ooh, blood. that angel's going to pass over the house. Yeah, wherever the blood was applied, the angel knew, hey, I'm not going to go there. The blood has been applied there. Yeah. I'm going to pass over it and hit the next house where it wasn't there. But the tents in Goshen, all of them had the blood, so the angel didn't even have to stop by there to visit because he saw blood everywhere. But in Egypt, where the blood wasn't applied, guess what happened? The firstborn of every house, whether it be son or daughter, whether it be animal, the firstborn animal, the firstborn son or daughter, were taken and killed yeah. by the death angel. Uh -huh. And that is why that is considered to be a perpetual uh, ceremony to the Egyptians as a reminder of how God passed over them where the blood was applied. Now understand this. Here comes Jesus, born as a little baby, grew up, and he was 12 years old, walking with his mom and daddy on their way to the Passover feast. This kid, 12 years old, is being ministered to by the Holy Ghost. He stripped himself of his deity, and he became human, just like everybody else. Now can you imagine Jesus being reminded of the Holy Spirit on his way to the Passover feast, 
being reminded to the Holy Spirit, that's going to be you one day on that cross. You are going to have to pay the sin, the ransom of every man's sin on a cross. You. 12 years old. He still probably trying to process all of this. He probably wasn't trying to think about it right now because he knew that was going to be one of the greatest feats you could ever imagine having to face. And Jesus was going to one day be the Passover lamb that was on that cross. This man, Jesus, as 12 years old, would be the one that would have to pay the ransom for many sins. So here they are on their way to the feast. They go to the Passover feast. No doubt it was the biggest crowd you can imagine. You know, they got the marketplace there in Israel, all the people out there, the vendors and stuff selling products and so forth. But during that time, everybody put all, everything to, the, to, to stop. And they all met at the temple to where they would worship and praise God during the ceremonial portion where they would uh, offer up sacrifices and praise Almighty God for the Passover. And they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread where they couldn't eat unleavened bread for seven whole days. And this whole feast went on. And you had different other, you know, different events that had taken place. But they would commemorate the hand of God being upon them and passing over them and sparing their lives as a nation because of the blood of Jesus that was applied. But, but back there was the blood of bulls and goats because a lot of people didn't have the spiritual connotation of that. Now, Jerusalem is called the city of God. Jerusalem. That's what Jerusalem means. City of God. Some people call it the city of peace. Salem. Shalom. You know, peace. Salem. Passover. The city of God. City of peace. It represents the very presence in the mind of Almighty God. Now, you got to understand, during the time of Jesus' crucifixion, as he broke bread with the disciples, can you imagine, as he's breaking bread with the disciples, the real Passover lamb is being prepped and ready to be offered up as a sacrifice on the very night of the Last Supper. That's in the literal sense, but in the spiritual sense, Jesus was going to have to be crucified that very evening in a realistic sense and be made as the sacrifice of mankind. Can you imagine maybe the pressure that went through his mind? Can you imagine the thoughts of filling every nail Every plucking of the uh, of the beard and every whip mark from his back being opened up yeah. and opened up from the cat and nine tails whip that is designed to tear chunks of flesh out of your body. Yeah. The spittle that would just come down his beard and the hatred that he would be seen through human flesh as it would exude hatred and rejection. And here he is having to lay down his life on behalf of you and I as the Lamb of God. Imagine that, what went through his mind. Well, you can imagine it because it, sure, it surely happened. But let's go back. He's 12 years old now. He's 12 years old. And now Mary and Joseph, they're on their way to the Passover lamb. They go out and, you know, engage in different, you know, fellowships and so forth. They, they called it koinonia back there, where we still call it koinonia, where you fellowship, you have fellowship togetherness and, you know, loving on each other and you encourage one another and so forth. That's why it's important to come to church, not just go at home and watch it on television or streaming. That's a supplement. That's only a supplement if, for whatever reason, you cannot be there. But you don't make that the main meal. A supplement can't heal your body if you're using it as a main meal because it's not supposed to be used as a main meal. It only supplements the main meal. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. So to come to church is the real deal. It's the main meal. When you come to church, it's called a gathering. We're called the ecclesia. Somebody say ecclesia. Ecclesia. It means, it, it, it means we're the church. We're the called out ones, the ecclesia. We're the called out ones that are coming together in koinonia and fellowship. There's something about coming together that actually seems uh, mysterious because you can't get the same anointing listening to it on a YouTube video. You may get the message and you may understand the message, but you're not going to feel the deliverance power unless you're in the atmosphere where it's actually moving. And that's where things take place and transpire. Do y'all understand that? Holy Ghost, you're getting ready to move now. I feel him up and down the aisles. Y'all, I, I don't know if you feel this anointing coming on us, but it's getting ready to take off like a rocket. Just hold me. Listen, fasten your seatbelts. We're getting ready to take off. Listen. So now here, here they go, and, and, and they're, 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 they went a day's journey, the Bible says. They went a whole day's journey thinking that he was with them. You know, and many people right now, we are thinking that Christ is with us. And in most cases, he is. But I'm here to tell you, sometimes we've veered, and we don't even know how far we've 
veer. We just started just a few feet. I'll never forget the time we went to uh, Jamaica. And what, I, I don't know, uh, were you there with us, uh, Curtis? Yeah. Did you go with us to Jamaica Beans? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't? You're okay. Well, then, years ago, we went on a, a, a missions trip to Jamaica. And, and Curtis remembers this. Uh, he and myself and a couple other uh, people out there in the deep water. We, our hotel was called the, the Sahara Delamere Hotel. The hotel that had the iguanas crawling up the hallway and the, the walls of your bed. Iguanas, I mean live iguanas, right there in your room. I mean, I, how many know I couldn't go to bed? <laughs> I tried to pull the bed head, the headboard away from the wall, but it was made onto the wall. <laughs> so them things could come in your bed. I was up all night trying to kill iguanas and look tiny mosquitoes. Oh, God, don't even mention the ants. <laughs> oh, Jesus, that's a whole nother story. But, man, I was itching and going on. I couldn't sleep at night. I felt like Elvis Presley. I couldn't sleep at all last night. <laughs> I mean, man, I had bugs everywhere. But listen to this. We were out there in the water, and we had these balls, you know, and, and, and beach balls and stuff. Him, uh, Brother Curtis, myself, our first lady at that time, and a couple other people out there, about 12 of us. We were out there just having a good time, diving up under the water, touching the stingrays at the bottom, coming back up, you know, seeing who can hold their breath the longest, diving, swimming further out, having a little swim break. We were way out there in the deep, and we were right in front of the hotel. 30 minutes go by, just fun and excitement and just jubilation and just having a good time. My wife, she's, she's not a swimmer, so she was talking to to some of the ladies sitting there doing some other stuff at the shore where, the, where the, uh, other people were. But we were the ones that went out to the deep, y'all. We were swimming out there in the deep. And before we do it, we looked up. Did, and, 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 and tell me and correct me if I'm wrong. We looked up, we were about a half a mile away from the Sahara Delamere Hotel. We were a half a mile away. We were playing right there in front of it. You could just walk out there and then swim. And just a few yards, we were out there in the deep. But then we played for so long until we had just shifted and shifted and shifted and shifted and having so much fun going on down, diving under, swim races and stuff. Before we knew it, we were about a half a mile, maybe a half to a quarter of a mile or so, but it was a long ways. We were like way over there. We could see the hotel way over there. We had drifted, yeah. having a good time, thinking we were right in front of where we should have been, but we were far off base. That's how it is with our walk with Christ, if we're not careful. Right. We drift, right. thinking he's with us. That's right. That's right. Thinking that everywhere we go, he's got our back. Uh -huh. yeah. We know he's, uh, he's got our back because he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He won't leave us, but sometimes we leave the circle of God, oh, which yeah. is called the wheel. It's the wheel. It's yeah. the wheel. Yeah. You walk outside of the wheel, you have no protection. Yeah. You walk outside of the wheel, you will open yourself up like a big, huge target. Yeah. The Holy Ghost only go so far. He can literally cover all the ends of the earth, but he'll only go as, hard, as far as your heart will allow him. Right. If you walk outside of the wheel, he won't go certain places. Yeah. You know how it is when sometimes we speed 85 miles an hour down the road because we're late, you know, and, and we say, oh, Holy Ghost, be with us. I heard somebody told me that the Holy Ghost only stays there at 80, 80 miles an hour, 85, the angels fly off and you're on your own. <laughs> I don't know how true that is or not, but... <laughs> Right around 85 miles an hour, you're totally on your own, buddy. God got a protection about 80, 80, maybe 82, but 85, you're on your own. 9,800, you're all totally on your own. Because God don't break the speed limit. He is the one that told us in Romans to obey the laws of the land, which means he respects the laws of the land. He's not going to break the laws of the land. He's not going to give you grace when you're going 85 miles an hour asking him to be with you. God says, I tell you what, I'll be with you if you slow down. Because we got to obey the laws of the land. He's trying to keep us afloat Amen. and trying to keep us safe. That's why he has rules, laws, and regulations and so forth. Amen. But they, 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 listen, as long as we're walking with Christ, we're living in uh, peace and favor and hope and the love of God. You know, as long as we walk, we walk in Christ, we walk in all the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, meekness, and temperance. As long as we're in Christ, we have faith and trust in the Lord. As long as we're in Christ, we're walking every step toward the destiny and the purposes that God has called us to walk in. Because as long as we're in him, our steps are being ordered by the Lord every single step. Even your stops are being ordered by God. Even when it looks like you're going through hell and back, God is there in the midst of it. Sometimes God will send you through hell in order to get to your next destination. Because there's a lesson in this hell journey you've got to get. 
It's called process. You can't curse the situation, but what you need to do is be quiet and light a candle. And let the Lord lead us because we can't curse the darkness but light a candle. And God will lead us the way everlasting. Sometimes it's the most unopportune thing you're going through, but there's a lesson to be learned even when you're fired, even through failure, even through rejection. God will give you lessons during these times. And it doesn't look like it's favorable, but it looks like it's anti-God. You prayed the opposite, but God will let a failure after you've prayed and fasted. And you say, Lord, I don't understand it. You don't need to worry about trying to understand it. Didn't the Bible tell you that God's ways are not like man's ways? Nor his thoughts like man's thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so are God's ways than our ways. So somebody shout hallelujah, Lord. But God is the one driving the helm. He knows what he's about to do. He's the one that circumnavigates things in our lives. Thank God he's at the will and we're not. So as long as we're walking in Christ, we walk in the wisdom of God, the grace of God, the favor with God and with man, like Jesus had. He said he grew in stature, and it said he grew in revelation and stature, so from he had favor with both God and with man. God will give you favor when you're walking in his presence, and when you're walking in him and so forth. But Mary and Joseph were not aware of the fact that Jesus was no longer with them. They were on autopilot. Autopilot. You know what that means, right? It's like the term comes from when you're driving an airplane, a pilot. And you're flying the course. You know pilots don't sit up there the whole time doing this in the sky. They're not doing that. They're not, they're not at the story where they're making turns in the sky. They just hit the button that says autopilot. They kick back, relax, read books, have the feet up on the steering column, sit there laughing and going on telling stories while the plane is flying itself. Because we're talking many, many, many hundreds and hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles of flight. And it's on autopilot. As long as the trajectory is going in the right direction, they're okay. They don't even have to touch the wheel because it's on autopilot. And some of us know the word of God backwards and forwards. We know the Christian cliches. God bless you. Highly favored of the Lord. We got all the cliches and stuff down. High five on one another. You know, all of this kind of stuff. And don't even know. Because you ain't been in prayer, you don't have a you don't have a refreshing of your spirit. You're in a rut. You're in a gummy way. You're in an alley. You're in a coldness. You're in a situation right now where you're dry. You're in a place of darkness, a place of loneliness. You need some peace. You need some uh, adjustment in your spirit. And many of us don't even know that we're on autopilot. Wow. And like we were out there in the middle of the ocean, right in front of the hotel, we drifted away from Christ. Supposing him to be with us, knowing that he's with us, but Jesus is a million miles away. You gotta move with the cloud. Because in the Old Testament, once the cloud moved, it was time for the tabernacle to be dismantled, taken up, and wherever the cloud went, the cloud would go, they would follow the cloud. Jesus is the cloud of God in our lives. And if you're not walking with the cloud, you're certainly not. On, on board with the cloud, you're walking against. You're behind. And you know what? Many people think to backslide means to go back into sin. Goes back into the clubs, go back into partying life, drinking drugs, um, uh, uh, smoking weed and doing drugs and drinking alcohol and having sex and cussing folk and embezzling money and stealing and giving piece of, people a piece of your mind, cussing them out, slapping them and all. You think that's what backslide means, to go back to that kind of lifestyle. That is a form of what backslide means. But another way of backsliding simply means this. Stay still and let the cloud keep moving. And you would have backslid and not even on it. Because you're not moving with the voice of God. You're not moving with the will of God. You're left behind. He's waiting up ahead of you just like that hotel. We drifted. We drifted. We were so far away thinking we were right in front of it, having a good time. And a whole quarter of a mile to half a mile away. By default, many of us think Christ is with us, but we have journeyed without him on autopilot. And we try to do like Samson did when he shook himself. And when he cut his locks off, he shook himself, the Bible says, like he did times before, but this time the power wasn't there. He shook himself and nothing took place. He was disappointed because the glory of God had departed from him. And many Christians are in church services. On autopilot. You go under the name of Christianity, but I'm here to tell you, you didn't pray this week. You didn't fast. You didn't win a soul to Christ. You weren't speaking any positive words of affirmation talking about how God was 
gonna move. Instead, we complain, we bicker, we grunt, we mediate, we did all kind of negative stuff, and we say we're Christians, but little do we know we got the name, but Christ is way ahead of you. You vaccinated and don't even know it. And walking in your own strength and power. No wonder you're all disgruntled and upset. No wonder you don't have the joy and the peace. No wonder you don't have the fervency you used to have. No wonder people see a dark, gloomy-looking cloud over your face now. Because the glory of God is departed. You're on autopilot thinking you got it in, in control. But in fact, you are in control. That's the problem. He's not, and you are. And as a result, we're frustrated. Get upset, we snap at people. How many of y'all have met Christians that are the nastiest, coldest, non-speaking folk you ever want to meet? I'm here to tell you, they weren't in the spirit at all. They were on our autopilot and Jesus was kicked out of the airplane. And they took over the wheel rather than Jesus taking over the wheel. And what you see driving them is their flesh. No spirit at all. That's because they thought Christ was with them. And this is what happened with Joseph and Mary. They thought, they supposed Jesus was with them. So then all of a sudden, after three days, not, not two, not one, three days. Come on now, what in the world, what in the world, <laughs> what are they doing? They, they, they came to the census and, they, and, they, and they, they were like, well, hey, we thought he was among the relatives. As a 12-year-old precocious child, we thought he was with the other kids playing around here, but Jesus was nowhere to be found. The Bible says they had to go back and trace their steps where they left him off. They had to go back and look for them. They had to go back. Somebody say go back. Go back. Listen, one of the greatest, greatest solutions to the greatest problem you can ever face, which means to walk without Christ, that's the greatest problem you can ever have because you're going to have some problems now. Amen. Christ ain't there, you're going to have problems. But listen, the greatest solution to your problem, the greatest fixture is to do this. Go back to where you dropped them off and pick them up again. Amen. Go back. It's simple. Go back. Go back. You don't have to sit here and try to conjure anything up. You don't have to sit here and try to justify any uh, reason why you've gotten to this point and your failures. You don't have to sit here and try to reason with your mind and understanding as to why you ended up here. All you have to simply do is go back. Go back. Go back. Thank God we can go back. Yeah. You have to sometimes move forward as long as he's moving forward with you. But if he's not with you, you better stand still wherever Jesus stands still at. Amen. But you got to sometimes go back. To find where you drop him off at. Because you won't have success without Christ. Amen. There's no way on the planet you could ever have success. I'll never forget the time my wife and I were in the church. And it's a very legalistic church. The pastor was in control. When I say the pastor was in control, I meant it just like that. The, I didn't say the Holy Ghost was in control. The pastor was in control. He would make us do crazy stuff. Like, you know, he'd come up with these ideas. And it's nothing wrong with doing certain things. But you got to be led of the Lord. He would have us come the ones of us who were on leadership he would out of the clear blue sky just wanted us to come for two solid weeks every day we had jobs to go to every day we had to meet at the church at 5 30 a.m to pray for a whole hour for two weeks in a row on staff i said well my job well you, you either come to church or you go to your job you decide and he'd make you feel bad if you couldn't go to church i mean to pray and when we went to pray at 5 30 in the morning he would be the one to pray for one solid hour. He prayed the prayer the whole hour. Nobody else prayed but the pastor. The whole hour. And everybody looking at each other. And then afterwards, he dismissed us. So the next day, we said, okay, no doubt, somebody else will pray. Nope, he prayed again the next day. And then the third day, somebody would show up. He would dog the person out like they were the worst person on the planet. Well, I, I don't understand why that ain't. And it come. You know, he just call a person's name out and say we need to pray for them. They're in a the backslidden state. How are you going to say they're in a backslidden state because they missed a 530 prayer that you're in control of yourself? But that's the mindset that this guy had and I was under this pastor for two solid weeks. This is way before the word of faith days. Way before. Way back before I even knew my wife. And, and, and this particular, well actually we were members of that church. This is when we, we got married. We ended up being members of over there. And, and, and he was so hard on people because he was in control. He was totally in control. Totally in control. And so what happened is the church literally, literally caught on fire and burned. And I was the evangelist of the church. We would go out and win 20 and 30 folks to the Lord. 
We would invite people in the church. We had, I was a member, I was, I was a student at Word of, uh, I mean, at uh, uh, Georgia State University before I went to East Texas Bible College in Tyler, Texas. I was there at Georgia State University as a student, and I would witness to everybody I could witness to. I would bring as many young folks to the church, and we would bring 20 and 30. I kid you not, I exaggerate not, 20 or 30, sometimes to 40, 35 or 40 people would come from my Bible study at Georgia State. I would invite them to my church. They would come, and they would pack the church out. And the pastor got up there, and instead of clapping and giving God glory and thanks, he, he was like, it was like he was offended for me bringing so many young folks in the church because everybody kept... I, I, didn't, I didn't have any control. People kept hitting me and said, great work, Charles. Good, good job, good job. Oh, man, praise God. People are coming in and stuff. And instead of him celebrating that more people were coming to the church, he, he sat there and made those people feel like foreigners. He didn't welcome them. And we would go out and do evangelism all the time. So you know what the pastor did? I'm not making this up. It's in my book. If you all have read my book, it's in there. He called it quits. Pull the plug on the evangelism ministry. Why do you do that? We're a successful ministry. It was because he wasn't the one winning the souls. He wanted the glory. He didn't want one of his ministers to get it. He wanted the glory. So he pulled the plug on the whole church. Wow. So all the people in the neighborhood that we used to witness to, he told us we can't go out and witness as a team anymore. Why would you ever stop right. evangelism, which is the will of God? It's growth. It's what Jesus called us to do. Right. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Yeah. He did the very contrary thing. It was as though Satan himself had pulled the plug. So I had to be obedient being under his ministry. So we didn't do anything, but I was griping on the inside because my ministry, that was my ministry evangelism. I couldn't operate in it because my church wouldn't support it. So I started praying for another church. You better believe I did. <laughs> Asking me to send, send God to send me to wherever he needed me to be. So during that time, the church literally caught on fire. And all these people in the neighborhood came by and showed up. All these people surrounding the whole neighborhood and stuff. And then all of a sudden, the pastor of the church looked around. I was right there with him because he and his wife kind of had tears in his eyes. We were out there looking at the firemen, putting the fire out. In fact, one of the head firemen was, was, was a guy that went to my high school. He, he, he was a fireman and ended up being the chief. And he and I talked and stuff because he was a, a, a high school student of mine at Southwest High School. And uh, so the pastor looked around and saw all those people. And he said these words. Where in the world all these people come from? Good Lord, where all these people come from? It was about two or three hundred people out there looking at the church catch on fire. And then I said, well, pastor, they're in the neighborhood. These are the folks we were trying to witness to before you pulled the plug on the evangelism. He said, well, I didn't even know all these people existed. And then one person in the back said, we were all here. We were all here. And so then he said, I wonder why these folks never came to church. And somebody yelled, and it's in my book, because the church ain't never been on fire before. Literally. <laughs> I said, that's a lesson in and of itself. <laughs> they ain't never been there because the church ain't never been on fire before. All the people were there and never, never did they come because every time they came, all they heard was flesh and not the power of the Holy Ghost. Right. You better have Jesus with you. Yes, sir. You better go back and get him and you better hold him tight and right. never, ever let him go again because I'm telling you, he makes all the difference. Listen to this. When the absence of God is in a person's life, the world becomes attractive. When the absence of God is in a person's life, the world becomes attractive. There's nothing wrong with whether he wants to be a girl or a boy. It doesn't matter. It's his choice. He can choose what he wants to choose. They're teaching this to your kids yes, they are. They in are. school. Yeah. And we're sitting back here saying, well, we all evolve and you have to make adjustments. Well, are you reading, child of God? Because if you read my Bible, you know good well God is a God of judgment if you're not careful. He's a God of love. I told you my minister message one day on, on, on the lion and the lamb. Because he's both a lion and a lamb. He has a big growl, but he's, he's got mercy and compassion and grace. But he's also got the law behind him, too. Amen? And don't misuse his judgments, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that he's both a lion and a lamb. And, 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 and kids are being taught this garbage in school now. Because the school, you know what they did? They came right on out. Back in the 60s, Jesus used to be in the, in the school, believe it or not. Those of you that were old enough to remember that, they used to have what they called prayer in school. 
And they had a pledge of allegiance, of allegiance, where you gave pledge to the flag and you prayed to Jesus in your school. And because of the fact that everybody started coming to the United States and they had different gods of worship from different countries and nations and cultures, we were cognizant of the fact that, well, we don't want to offend anybody else of that. Bump that. You go to China or somewhere else and they believe in Buddha and all these things and you come bring it in Jesus Christ or something, they're kicking you on out of there. They don't care about your God. They don't care about anything. They have their standards and one thing you got to give them credit for is they're not going to let anybody rock the boat for them. But here we are, the land of the free where everybody in the world is welcome and you bow down even to the point where you sell your soul to the devil and not even have Jesus Christ as Lord anymore. Take him off the bookshelves of our universities and the courthouse systems and take commandments have been taken out and you put new age there instead and Satanism. I don't understand it. The God of this world has blinded our minds that we believe not and the church has sat down in silence. You know why? Because we're on autopilot. If Jesus was there, he'd rise up inside of you. The line that come out roaring and not worry about what people think. Come hell or high water. You know one thing, if God be for you, he's more than the whole world is against you. But people don't have the backbone no more because they're sissified right now. They got backbone like a jellyfish or a piece of spaghetti. No backbone at all. And we sit here and let all of this stuff dictate to us what we need to do. Listen, Jesus was a revolutionary. He came to kick over the apple cart. Every time Jesus gave a speech, he had to run for his life. He didn't apologize. We sit back and twiddle our thumbs. And here we are, the representatives of God on the earth and don't have no backbone at all. Something's wrong with us. We left Jesus. We need to go back and find wherever we left. Your boldness is gone. The Bible last time I read said the righteous are bold as a lion. But the wicked flee when nobody even pursues them. But the righteous are kicked down the door and then ask, where's the fight? They don't care about the consequences. All we know is if God be for us, he's more than the whole world is against us. But we got so many pusillanimous little pansy Christians hanging around here. You know, don't know what to do. I'm here to tell you, we need a revival. We need to go and wash We need to go back and get Jesus. Because when you get Jesus, you get your victory back. When you get Jesus, you get your boldness back. Man, when you get Jesus, you get your joy back. Somebody shout hallelujah, Lord. Real quick, I'm closing out with this. My sister lost her son years ago uh, at Six Flags. My, my nephew, uh, Nathaniel. He was just a little kid. I'll never forget that I was working on a floor job. I used to install sand and refinish hardwood floors. I did that for 27 years. And one day she called me up real early. No, not real early, but it was around what, 10 o'clock, 10 30 or so, and telling me they were on their way to Six Flags and all of this. And then about 3 o'clock or so, she called me up in panic. And she was crying and going on. I said, What's wrong? What's wrong? My heart dropped because when somebody cries like that, you figure somebody died. Yeah. She said, Good day, good day. I said, I said, What happened to the she said, I lost him, I lost him. I said, what do you mean you lost him? We had six friends. Pray, be praying. I don't know where he is. We lost him. It's been an hour and a half. We can't find him. And the first thing she did once she lost her child, and any mother or father would do this, is panic yeah. sets in. Once you lose somebody, panic sets in. You freak out. You don't even think right. You're not thinking logical. All you do, listen, your focus is laser sharp on that one thing you lost. I gotta find it. Where is he? Nothing else matters. You don't care what you're doing. You're not even thinking logically. I did a floor job for this lady, and her kid was out there, fire ants had gotten all over the little kid. He was outside crying and screaming and going on. Then I ran out there and I said, I said Hey, your kid you got fire ants. She dropped the pot that was on the stove. The water was still running. The sink was on the floor. She didn't care. She ran like a bullet to her son. Panic setting. Laser focus. And people that don't have Christ have panic that sets in. You get far from your job. You freak out. My God, you almost, you know, once you get a negative report from the doctor, you lose it. You just, you, you, already, you already got your grave clothes picked out for your funeral. Just because you got a diagnosis. Don't even have a fighting chance to even fight the devil. You panic sets in. Where did it come from? Your husband or wife backslides, walks out on you with somebody else. You panic. You freak out. Now you're almost suicidal. Want to take your life. Your whole world crumbled. 
He left me. She left me. For another person, you panic, freak out, curse God because we don't see the answers coming. It's one of the first things that happen when you walk without Christ. You lose. Panic sets in. Next thing that takes place. I'll never forget the time one of the bass players at the church we attended years ago heard the word every, every single Sunday morning. He used to be a man of God on fire for Jesus. And all of a sudden, as soon as somebody stole his bass, one of his bass bases was stolen out of his car. That man ran outside, cussing up and down the sidewalk. God play with a mother blanket. God play with a mother blanket. And I said, what in the world? I didn't even know he had that in him. I said, what's your problem, brother? Man, they stole my blanket, blanket, guitar, man. They stole the mother blanket, blanket, stole my blanket. I said, what's your problem? I said, you're a child of God, aren't you? Oh, bump that. Those are his words. As though his whole church persona was a facade. Yeah. I'm just getting paid as a musician. Bump all that. Reality set in. This is who I really am. And that's exactly who he really was. Right. The real animal came out yeah. because of panic. Panic causes pressure. The pressure would literally expose who you really are. Pressure exposes not only who you are, but what you're really made of. You find that out under pressure. And that's exactly what came out. My sister lost it. She panicked, panicked. You know, many, many of us marry the wrong person. End up in the divorce course, divorce course, because you're panicking. Panicking because you're too old. You, you're not married yet. You're getting too old. Your biological time clock. You feel like it's not working. It's broke. It ain't even working now. Past the age. Don't worry about that. Move to the wrong state. Heard a voice say, get up, move. And didn't even pray and ask God. And then next thing you know, everything in the world is going bad for you because you made the wrong move at the wrong time. Because you didn't hear God speak. The Bible tells you to acknowledge him in all of your ways. And, you know, and he shall direct your path. But many of us don't listen to the voice of God. And we just move by impulse. Somebody told you this, that, and the other. Instead of going to your father and walking with Jesus and being in the will of God, we just act, act, a pen. We just move without even praying. And we suffer the consequences later. Work at the wrong job. You know, you detest going to work. Hate it, but you got to have a paycheck. That ain't even the will of God. Couldn't even be, may, may not even be God's will, but you just took it without praying. Many of us don't even pray. We just jump on stuff. Well, Studied the wrong major in school. Got student loans and all kind of loans. You got to pay back bigger than house notes almost. And, and, and you got the wrong major. That didn't even go to no kind of hint to what the major was. All that time wasted in study time and books and all of that and didn't even pursue the goal. It's just like panic is set in. And next thing you know, number two, you become self-centered. That's the second thing. After panic, comes in your self-centered. You're like the woman, which is in a good sense, but it was still in a negative sense. But in a good sense, she saw Jesus and she had an issue of blood. She didn't care who was in her way. She didn't care. The crowd was there. She, the Bible says she pressed her way past the crowd. She was probably knocking folk, elbow on folk, stepping on toes. She didn't go, oops, pardon me, excuse me, oops, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Trying to do the head number heart. Oops, kid. She just bailed like a bullet straight through the crowd. She could care less who she offended. She got one goal in mind. My healing, Lord. My healing. Yes. Self-centered. She was self-centered. Touched the hem of his garment. Yeah. And got her miracle. Because she had perseverance. She could care less how she looked, but that was in a good sense. But most panic is in a bad sense. Yeah. We become self centered. Nothing else matters until you get that thing. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times should come for men should be lovers of themselves, yeah. proud, boasters, blasphemers, mm. unthankful, un unholy, high minded, you know, the truth says, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of them that are good. And then he goes on to say, have a form of godliness. But they deny the power thereof. Think about it. These are times we're living in. Bad attitudes develop when you panic. And then next thing you know, you compromise your integrity. You just flat compromise it. You give up everything. Now people that walk in integrity will be taken advantage of. They're going to receive less money. Longer time, longer wait, but one thing they're going to have are bragging rights to know that I was first in line for God's blessings. Because when you do it God's way, you get God's results. Panic, panic causes you to cheat the system, lie, 
and do all kind of ungodly things that don't contain integrity. But I'm here to tell you, they found Jesus in his element. They found him. They found him after three days. They found him in his element. Doing what he's supposed to be doing. Doing what he was called, calling to do. Talking to doctors and lawyers and big time people that were aristocratic. And the Bible says that he was hearing them, listening to them, asking them questions. Because as a teacher, he had the authority to ask. But as a student, he had the humility to ask. Amen? Amen. And he understood answers and answered them and it blew their mind. Who is this little 12 year old kid talking to us on our level? Blew their mind. And when Mary and Joseph finally got a hold of him he says, don't you know mama? I've been about my father's business. Joseph looking like, well if you were about my father's business you would have been with us. He was talking about his heavenly father. He was talking about his heavenly father. And the Bible says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Yeah. And I close with this. Acts 10 38. Bible talks about how Jesus Christ went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. He went about doing good. Jesus went about doing good. Yeah. He went about doing what? Good. Doing what? Good. Doing what? Good. But why do you want to hate him? Why do you hate a person doing good? That's all he did. He opened the blind eyes, unstopped deaf ears, caused the lame to walk, cast out devils, raised the dead, forgave men of their sins, loved his enemy, died for the sin of the entire world, went about doing good, not evil, but good. Yeah. Yet the world hated him. You know why? Because the Bible tells us, so crystal clear, it tells us in Isaiah that in the last days, it tells us that men are going to start uh, they're going to hate good and, and they're going to love evil. Yeah. And they're going to call bitter sweet and sweet bitter. Yeah. And they're going to love darkness and they're going to hate light. Yeah. Woe unto them, the Bible says in chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. Yeah. We're living in a generation right now. Yes, sir. You got the LGBTQ and I don't bash anyone that is suffering and going through that because I know it's a spirit behind that. Oh, yeah. And that person needs prayer. And I'm not going to bash anyone and I'm going to love everybody as equal as I can. But I'm here to tell you, it's no way in the world at all. It's no way in, 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 in H-E double hockey sticks Come on, Pastor. Talk about that this preacher is ever going to agree with that lifestyle when the Bible is against that kind of lifestyle. Amen. Just like it is if you're heterosexual and you got a wife and got a girlfriend on the side. God's against that. Talk about and everybody can clap on that. But you can go out and change your sex. And you mean to tell me he's for that? The devil is a liar. And we need to be woke, for real. <laughs> Talk about the movement of wokeness. We need to really be woke. And understand this, because I'm here to tell you. He wasn't a pedophile. He wasn't an a, a adult sexual guy that attracted to young kids or anything. He wasn't a murderer. He wasn't an adulterer. He was not a rapist. He wasn't a thief. He wasn't an embezzler of money or con people out of their money. He wasn't a wife beater. He wasn't a liar, a backstabber, a drug addict. No, he was an alcoholic. But he went about doing nothing but good. Yeah. And the world hated him. They hated him. But I'm here to tell you, if they hated Jesus, what makes you think you're going to escape? Come on, talk about it. All right. If we name the name of Christ, child of God, you better brace yourself. All hell is getting ready to come your way. But I'm here to tell you, as long as God be with you, he's more than the whole world is against you. When all hell comes your way, you can get ready to raise your hand and shout hallelujah anyhow. It means to tell me that God knows there must be something inside of me so powerful that all hell has to charge full force at me. It must be something inside of you the devil's after. And I'm telling you, it's the glory of God. Child of God, lift up your head on you gates. Be lifted up. He has the doors and the king of glory shall appear. Somebody shout hallelujah, Lord. Jesus is over there. He's the savior at the head of the EBT program. You know why? Because he's the, the, the cattle upon a thousand hills belongs to the Lord. Right. He's over Medicare and Medicaid because with his stripes, we've been healed. Somebody shout hallelujah. He's got all my insurance, man. I don't just have a piece of the rock, but I'm standing on the rock of Christ. He's the rock of my salvation. His birth was contrary to the laws of life. His death was contrary to the laws of nature. He startled kings. He puzzled doctors. He's the gold of all goodness, the summit of all thoughts, the pride of all character, the perfection of all beauty. He's the incarnation of all tenderness, manifestation of all might, personification of all power. He's the living illustration of all truth. He's the leader greater than Moses, the priest greater than Aaron, the king greater than David. He's wonderful. Cast 
the Father, Prince of Priests. Somebody shout hallelujah, Lord. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and eased pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He has risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The world can't understand him. Armies can't defeat him. Schools can't explain him. Leaders can't ignore him. Harold couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. People couldn't hold him down. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler can't silence him. Cops can't replace him. And America can't hold him down. Late night talk shows can't explain him away. Somebody shout hallelujah, Lord. The question is, where did you leave Jesus? Did you leave him in a divorce court when you got divorced? Where did you leave him? Did you leave him when your husband and wife walked out? Where did you leave him? Wherever you left him, go back and get Jesus. Somebody say, go back and get Jesus. Tell your neighbor, go back and get the Lord. Hallelujah. Did you leave him when you got fired from the job? Did you leave him after the first child came? Did you leave him after the love of God? Wherever you left him, go back and get him. Pick him up. Bring him with you. You need him. Many people fell into sexual sin and prison cells in their minds and all kind of different cells because they travel too long yeah. without Christ. Right. It's time to go back yeah. and get your Jesus. Yeah. Jesus told the church of Ephesus, I got something against you. You have left your first love. Yeah. Yes, sir. Repent, he said, and do your first works. We got to repent, church. Your way has been made hard because the Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard. It's hard. He that is often reproved and that stiffens his neck, the Bible says, you know, is suddenly destroyed and that without remedy. God has reproved us and corrected us because he loves us. Whom the Lord loves, he scorns and chases us every son that he receives, the Bible says. If he be without chastisement, we have all the partakers. The Bible says it this way. Then are you bastards and not sons. A bastard is a fatherless child. You're without me as your father, he says. That's why God spanks us because he loves us. He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to correct you. Every head by every eye closed. You may be here as a Christian today. But many months or weeks or even years. You may have been walking this race or running this race without a pilot. You were work, working on autopilot, thinking Jesus or supposing Jesus was with you. When you dropped him off some point, at some point, maybe you slept around one time and as a result, you never forgave yourself. God forgave you. You asked him for forgiveness. He forgave you, but the devil kept bringing condemnation. Condemnation is of the devil, but conviction is of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will convict you to make you get things right. But when you get things right, the devil will still whisper in your ear after God has already forgiven you. Well, look, you you, you can't raise your hands high. Look at what you did last week. But if God forgave you, he doesn't have a remembrance of it. You got to forgive yourself. Condemnation comes from you not forgiving yourself. Listen to the voice of the devil that tells you God is still holding you in contempt when you repented. And if you did repent, God has no remembrance of it. Yeah. Now you gotta forgive you. Yeah, yeah. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you feel convicted because there's something you've wrong, done wrong, and you have never gotten out of that funk. You've never shaken yourself free. It's like there are weights and tons, and you're displacing, uh, and you're, you're, you're very disgruntled, and you, my friend, are very restless. And you don't have your joy, you don't have your peace back, you don't have your fun you used to have in Christ back. It's a burden to come to church now. It's a drudgery to have to do reading your Bible and fasting. That's not even a thing of something you even think about. It's like you lost it. You lost it. You used to have the fervor, the joy, the zeal, the fire, the anointing. But you've lost it. And you can get it back this morning, child of God. All you gotta do is come down to this altar and pick Jesus up wherever you drop him off at. Go back, replace, re, re, retrace your steps. Go back, wherever you put him off at, that's where he still stands, waiting for you to join with him. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat right now. Come on down here to the altar. Come down to the altar right now. Come down right now to the altar. 
If you want to get your fire back, your zeal back, your fervor back, your anointing back, you want to pick them up where you left them off at. Come on down. Don't look around. It's time to get it right with God. It's you and God. Listen, a real man and a real woman says, bump what people think. I'm just going to do what I feel led to do by the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, you're the one that's going to get your answer. You're the one that's going to be turning the world upside down. You're the one that's going to be the world changer. You need to come on down. If you want your zeal back, you want your fire back, your fervor back.